Well, it seems like you guys are so glad to be here. Let's give God one more shout of praise and let's express how great it is to be here today. Right? <laughs> Woo! So, like Alexa says, we look amazing for fasting. We're on day four. You guys made it today. We're the remnant. That's what it means, right? Usually on day three, that's the hardest. So we cleared the hump and we're ready to receive amazing things from God. And I am super excited to continue on this series of seeing beyond. Are you guys ready for beyond? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share seven key things to help us all get to that beyond. Because the goal isn't just to see beyond this year, but it's actually to get to that beyond, right? How many of you guys just want to see the beyond? You don't want to get there. Okay, good. I'm in the right place. So seven key things. Make sure you have a pen, a paper. If you have your Bible, if you have your Bible today, you have a million heaven points. I'm giving them out today. So you're going to want to take notes. We're going to start off with number one. So number one says, Before we can see our beyond, we must know our within. So say it again. Number one, before we can see our beyond, we must know our within. So God cares more about the inner man than he does the appearance. God doesn't care how we look. He doesn't care the clothes that we have on, the shoes that I have on, the watch that I have on. He doesn't care how strong I am. He doesn't even care how stinky I am. God cares about the person inside. You know, I know my neighbor cares about how stinky I am, but but God doesn't. So that's the good news. And I wanted to start off with a couple of verses that establish this idea that God cares more about the inside than the outside. So we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. And so this says, you guys can see, good. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so this is the Old Testament verse. God's establishing that when he's about to establish a king, he doesn't care about the outside. He doesn't care how strong he is, how many battles he won, you know, who he knows. All of those things are not important. He cares about the inside. And in the New Testament, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And this is where Jesus establishes as well that the importance is on the inner. And this applies to us as well because it's talking about fasting. And so verse 16, or yes, chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Jesus is saying, And when you fast, don't make it obvious, as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. How many of you guys have looked disheveled this week, right? we got to repent. Um, I tell you the truth. That is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, Jesus says, comb your hair, wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father who knows what you do in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. And so right off the bat, there's an importance on the inner person. And so what I wanted to start off with is letting you guys know our internal condition or ability it affects the way we see the externals. Does that make sense? Okay, so what we're going to do is just a little game. So media, don't show it yet. I'm going to prove this point that your internal affects the way that you see the external. So the game is, it's a lightning round. One round, one winner for 10 billion heaven points. I'm going to show an image on the screen. So whoever knows what this image is, just shout it out as fast as you can, all right? This is 10 million, I didn't remember what I said, 10 million heaven points. Are you guys ready? The first person who does it wins. Here we go. Media on three. One, two, three. Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, so all of you that said Mona Lisa, you're wrong. It's a cat. You'll see that there's a dog in the photo, there's a man. There's a bunny. There's wings on her face. What kind of picture is this, right? So you can take the image off. So the point that I'm getting at is that I prepped you guys to answer quickly, right? I I conditioned you to just lightning round. I got to say this answer because I want to win. But if some of you 
would have exercised a little restraint. So, you know what? I don't know if I trust this Frank guy. There's, a, there's, a, there's always a catch with Frank, right? And you would have said, I'm going to pause for a second, and then I'll respond when I really know what it is. I'm going to take time to examine it. See, that's a different person than how I prepped you guys to be. You follow? Okay. So, the reason why I say all of this is because at the start of this year, um, every year I always, always, always try and set goals for myself. Are you guys goal setters? Okay, good. So I always try and set goals. I try and get ahead of the game, and I'll start in November. And so I can just plan out by January, I'm already ready for the new year. And this year, it was hard. I could not come up with any goals. November came and went. December came and went. January, I'm like, I don't even know what to plan this year. I'm just going to plan nothing. But God revealed to me, I was, I was on to something. So I decided instead of setting goals, I'm going to set three things I'm going to focus on. And those three things were, number one, to be genuine. Number two, to pay attention to the details. And number three, care about everything. So for me, that was extremely hard because, I mean, it's, it's hard already to be genuine. But it's hard to be genuine when you're a Christian, Right, because you have to forgive people, and sometimes you don't want to forgive people, and you have to, you know, you have to smile when you don't want to smile, right? Um, you know, you have to keep your character to a certain level. There's so many challenges when it comes to being genuine, right? There's so many challenges caring about everything. My goodness, with all the things that happen, my wife is 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 looking at um, what happened in Australia, and she's crying, and I'm I'm trying to just like ignore her because normally I don't care, but I had to force myself to care about the koalas and the kangaroos, and it breaks my heart when you stop and you care. It's so hard, you guys. Um, and then don't even get started on details. Uh, I, I'm yeah okay. So anyways, so that's what I that's what I'm trying to do, and the reason behind this is because you have to look at it. It's it's like a black and white thing, right? I, I decided that if, if 21 days I cannot be genuine, I cannot care about everything, and I can't pay attention to the details, then that means most likely for the rest of the year, I'm going to be a fake person who doesn't care about the condition of the things in my life. And when you look at it that way, you're like, dang, I don't want to be that person. And so the struggle is real, but I'm trying to do that. And I'm not trying to be perfect by any means. I know I'm going to mess up. I know I'm not going to care about some things, and I'm not going to be genuine all the time. But my goal is to establish a system within myself that could recognize immediately when I'm out of whack. Right? It's kind of like when your cell phone updates, you know, when you hate it, and it takes forever. But every day, right, there's, there's some kind of lure of temptation. And, and, and Satan wants to get you to sin. But every day that I update my system with God, I'm going to be like, wait a minute. Uh-uh. No, devil, get your hand out of there. See, I'm ready. I updated this morning. So that's why I'm focusing on those things. And after January, I feel like I can set goals that are based in God, but not in myself. So simple formula. That's what I'm doing. Um, so here's another, uh, another freebie. So once we identify the weak points in our system, we can then better strengthen them. Really simple. But it's true, right? And we just overlook that all the time. Okay, so here's number two. We must locate true beyond. You know how there's a true north when you have a compass, right? And we're in the series of C beyond. We must locate the true beyond. So if, if you guys get lost, you don't want me on your team. I'm a horrible navigator. I don't know what it is. I can't tell directions to save my life. You do want me if you want to survive because I love prepping. I know how to start a fire. I know how to do all these things. I can survive. But when it comes to directions, we will get lost and we will never be found. <laughs> Only Jesus will find us. Um, and so, oh, so, so the, the point that I'm bringing up about this, we must find this true beyond, is that it's really easy for us to begin to look for things that make us happy, right? Where I'm looking on how to get a raise. I'm looking to find some friends. I'm looking to get married. I'm looking to get kids. I realize kids are hard. Oh my goodness, I'm looking for a babysitter. We're searching constantly for these things that make us happy. And there's nothing wrong with things that make us happy, but there's a difference between happiness and joy. And instead of pursuing happiness, we should be pursuing joy. Because happiness is that temporal thing that only lasts for a certain amount of time. 
But joy is that thing where you know that God has everything under control, that the victory's already won in your life and in the kingdom of darkness, so you don't have to worry. That's that joy that can't get taken away. And so I want to read a couple of stories about people who know what joy is all about, and that person is Daniel. So we're going to turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 6, starting off at verse 3 through 5. So you guys have heard the story, Daniel in the lion's den. It's a popular one, but I love this story on how it shows that Daniel has joy and happiness, but he understands how to just live a life full of joy. So, verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Now, have you ever been in that place where you just worked and worked and finally you can see results about to happen? It's like, finally I get recognized. This is going my way. Whether I've been a good worker, a good student, I've been a great husband, a great father, you can see that you're about to get this reward and you anticipate it, right? That's happiness. That's pursuing happiness. Everybody say, but haters. But haters, they always come and they try and destroy everything. Daniel had some haters because he was so good at what he did. He was so good at following God, at working hard. So verse 4. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy so they concluded okay so when you guys read your bible do you guys change the voices to make it more fun yeah i do it you got to do it 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 changes everything okay so they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion (laughs) then they told the king that man daniel the one, the captive from Judah. Oh, he's ignoring your law. Mm. He still prays to God. Not one. Oh, not two. But three times. Yeah, I'm disgusted. Right? Haters just trying to bring you down. And so, I just lost my place. I'm having too much fun, you guys. <laughs> okay. And so, at, at this moment, right, the king realized it's a trap. So his officials tricked him ignorantly into creating a law that nobody can pray to any god except the king. So taking a a step back, the king loves Daniel. He was about to promote him top official over everything. It doesn't get any better than that, right? So the king loves Daniel, but he's a king. He's a man of his word. He cannot go back on that law. What's written is what, what is written. He spent an entire day trying to figure out how to get out of that. But there was no chance, there was no hope. And so at last, verse 16, so at last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, may your God whom you serve so faithfully rescue you. Verse 19, very early the next morning, the king got up, hurried out of the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, Was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Now, pause right there. The fact that the king had so much reverence for God to even explain it like that shows how incredible a man David was. I don't know. Even in my life, I have to admit, I mean, I try and be my best, but I've never heard anyone praise God just because of the way that I live my life, especially someone who doesn't believe in God. And so Daniel is amazing. The king understands how great God is, and Daniel's response is this, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. And so that right there is joy, where you can get Here's, here's a blessing, here's a gift, here's something special for you, all of these things that you're looking for, 
and they get taken away, and it doesn't faze you at all. See, you can be, you can't be sad and happy at the same time. It's impossible. But you can have a moment of sadness and still have joy. You can have a moment of fear and still have joy, right? And that joy is that, oh, my God, there's no light at the end of the tunnel but God. That's what joy is. And that's what we should be pursuing as we navigate for the true beyond. Not looking for things, goals this year that are going to make us happy, but what's going to give us joy that can't be taken away. Amen? All right. So number three. We must improve our ability to see clearly. I'll say it again. Improve our ability to see clearly. So once we understand that we can locate, you know, true beyond, right, that's when the storms come. And the storms come to distract us from our destination. They try and intimidate us. They try and get us to focus on a different place. And so really, what storms try and do, instead of getting to our beyond, right, let's say that we know where that is. Storm comes, and it tries to get us to focus on getting to safety, instead of beyond, right? It was like, everything is happening. Oh my God, my kid's crazy. Um, we just got audited by the IRS and we don't even make this much money, right? I lost my leg. I don't know. It's just a storm comes in and then it's like, okay, I can't even function. I can't even fathom. I need to take a step back. Let's redirect to safety. And what happens is if you keep on going to safety, instead of keeping your eyes fixed on your beyond, you'll begin to say that safety is your beyond. And you'll stay there. And you'll think, well, my, my, my goal, what God has called me, is to get through these storms in life. That's my destination. You ever feel like you've been working on something constantly? You put hours and hours in, and you're looking for these results. And after, let's say, weeks or months or years, you feel like you haven't done anything? That's what a storm is. A cycle. You just keep doing the same thing and you never get to your beyond. And so, so this is what I wanted to invite you with as well. Um, let me see, make sure I'm not ahead of myself. This is where I get too excited, you guys. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, no. So, for storms, right? Um, after understanding this, I get, I get, I got tripped up where, so as I was trying to start my goals, um, I wrote out, you know, this year, okay, the given, try and be a better Christian, try and be a better man, try and be a better husband, a better father. Have you guys ever, you know, set any goals like that? Which is to try and be better. And so I wrote them out and it just didn't feel satisfied with those. And then it's like the light bulb went off where I set these as goals but they're really job descriptions, right? When you're a Christian, there's a job description. You have to get better. You have to love more. You have to improve. You have to be uncomfortable. You have to share your faith. You have to read the Bible. You have to pray. It's in the job description. You can't be a Christian and not operate like one. And so that's why we've come up with these titles, right? So there's the Christian, and then there's the real Christian, right? And then there's the real, real Christian, and then there's the anointed Christian. And it's all the same thing. It's just that we've lost sight of the fact that there's a job description, and then there's a beyond. There's a destination, and we can't confuse the two. Amen. It's good. Okay, so now, the fun part. So, number four, we have to navigate the unknown. Again, we have to navigate the unknown. So this is what everybody hates. You can put in parentheses next to number four, trust. Because nobody wants to trust God until he says, what's going to happen? Right? God says, go there, and you say, what's going to happen? Go there, why? Go there, how? Go there, <sighs> okay. Right? Right? It's so scary to travel in the unknown because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to look like a fool. You don't feel validified. You don't feel qualified. 
There's so many reasons why you shouldn't go into the unknown. I think our instinctive nature says, don't do it. But God says, do it. And so I have a funny little example of traveling into the unknown. But before I do that, say to your neighbor, it's exciting when I don't know what God is planning for me. <laughs> Amen. We are changing right now. Okay. Jeremy, can you give me the, the, those cones right there? So as I'm setting this up, um, this is a little example. Um, what I love about journeying into the unknown is, so we have an amazing God, right? He's powerful. Um, he is phenomenal. He's incredible. He's amazing. Um, the key about God and the unknown is we have a God that doesn't know how to fail. He, you have to take a second and look at that. My God doesn't know how to fail. So if my God doesn't know how to fail, and I'm following my God, and my God is in me, then I can't fail. Right? So that's the foundation of trust. Nevertheless, we struggle with it. So there, I don't even remember how many years ago, but there was um, a few years ago, I went to, it was an event that my friend's church had. Um, and during this event, the the... The idea of it was basically we all came together to experience God, you know, to just let the Holy Spirit reveal himself. Um, and it was an incredible event. This, this event actually marked, it was like a, a pillar in my life of faith. And it was just, it was a small, minuscule moment that you guys will probably laugh about, but it was huge for me. So actually, Jeremy, can you give me the balloon as well? So, um... And it's a true story. Actually, the guy that was, um, that was there is in this room. I didn't tell him I was sharing this, but um, maybe after, after service, or maybe he'll just raise his hand and say, yeah, it's true, hallelujah. Anyways, so we were, so I was at my friend's church, and um, it was kind of like downtime where we were just hanging out, just talking, shooting the breeze, and my friend, um, he got the hiccups. And it's no big deal, it's the hiccups, right? Um, but it began to go on for a while. Like, he just kept hiccuping. And so some of his friends, you know, said, okay, you got to hold your breath, drink some water, you got to do this, do that. And, and nothing was working. And I don't know why, something about those hiccups just didn't settle with me. And I started to think, you know, well, maybe I should pray for him. I was like, okay, well, this, this is my church. You know, I, should, I should just calm down. I should relax a little bit. But something about those hiccups, they got me. And then what got me even more upset was, so some of the guys started to say, oh, you know what you do? You know what you need, man? You need a remedy. And I was like, oh, hell no. You don't need a remedy. You need Jesus. <laughs> right? But inside, I'm in, I'm in my little square, and nobody knows how I feel. I'm just like, man, why doesn't somebody just pray for him? And I'm just, I'm just there, and I'm just waiting. And God's like, why don't you go travel to the unknown? And I was like, God, I don't, I don't want to because what if it doesn't work? I'll look like an idiot. And he says, why don't you just travel in the unknown? It's just hiccups. They're going to be gone in like 10 minutes. Why don't you travel in the unknown? Ugh, okay. And so I was, I was so nervous. I don't think it appeared that way. But I just walked over and I said, you know what? And this is what, this is what it looks like when you travel into the unknown. You have your square, right? You step out a little bit in faith. You gain a little bit more territory. And I said, you know, I'm, I want to pray for you. Um, I said, in Jesus' name, your hiccups are gone. And wouldn't you believe it? They're gone. And I was like, I was like, wait a minute. Did that really just happen? I was shocked because it was such a small little thing, but it worked. And God showed me that his power is real. But I want to show you. So this is what it looks like when, when we're in 2020, right? And, and God begins to show us our beyond, and we come up with excuses about how we can't. So I have to put the microphone down for this. God, um, I, I can't. Oh, God, I'm so afraid. God, um, I, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if you're with me. Oh, God, please. Please, God. I don't know. And then 
you want to know what else it sounds like because, right, we're, we're a child of God. If you've ever taken something away from a child and they start to whine and scream, this is what we sound like when we talk to God and we give him excuses. I just can't. I can't. Right? And I, I believe God looks at us like we're just these little kids that just haven't got it yet. It's so easy. It's so simple. But we complicate it. What I wanted to share with you is that the unknown and trust work together for your benefit. There's no easy way to do it. There's no tricks. There's no tips. Just do it. When God tells you, do it, and you'll be surprised. Number five, understanding that fasting and prayer is the doorway to our beyond. We have to understand that fasting and prayer is the doorway to our beyond. If, let's say, if it's your first time here today, I know I saw one, I wasn't able to remember where it was, but if you're, your first time and, um, you know, you're, you're looking for a, a church to, to be with, I'd encourage you to join us for the fasting and prayer. Um, if you have been joining us and you're not fasting or you are fasting, but you're not taking it seriously, the cheeseburger demon got you, you know, for the past four days and it's only been four days. I would encourage you and challenge you to take prayer and fasting seriously. And if you don't believe me, let me hit you with this. The moment that initiated Jesus's ministry was his, him passing the test of fasting for 40 days. His ministry did not start until Satan tempted him. And we're going to read that. We're going to take a look and examine this. So this is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, but we're going to jump around some verses. So starting with verse 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Now, we got it easy. We got 21 days. 40 days, that's like murder in modern society. I think once you get to like day 18, you're already looking for reasons to break your fast, right? A wedding's happening. I got my little niece's birthday. I have to eat the cake or else, you know, you're already looking for reasons. I can't imagine what 40 days looks like. I bet rocks start to look like bread. Crickets start to look like chicken nuggets, right? 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. And so Satan slithers in, right? And he doesn't bash Jesus. He doesn't say, you're not worthy. He doesn't say, you're nothing. Look at you. You can't even lift 100 pounds. No, he brings in, right, that happiness or that satisfaction, instant gratification, where he says, I can give you this right now. Do you want it? I can give you that. You've been wanting this. And mind you, this is Jesus in the flesh. He's the son of God, but he's struggling just as much as we are. Right? And that's what happens is where you begin to not take fasting and prayer seriously. Right? You begin to say at day five, I already got my word from God. I'm good. I don't need to fast anymore. Right? How many of you have done that? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But Jesus kept the strength. And after Satan offered him these amazing things, he ended up saying on verse 10, Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came back and took care of Jesus. And so this passing of the test was so crucial because what it proved was that number one, Satan can't stop Jesus. And number two, Satan can't influence Jesus. And so the deal was set. There's nothing else he can do. And if we decide to give in when God has called us as a group to fast together for vision, to see beyond, and we say, you know what? I want to see just a little bit. What you're saying is that Satan can stop 
or yield you or redirect you. And you're also inviting Satan to influence your year because you haven't told him no. And I do not want any kind of influence from Satan in my year. And that's why these 21 days are extremely crucial. If you can't do this for 21 days, forget about it for the rest of the year. This is our time to prove that we're serious. So <clears throat> these 21 days are key to unlock our potential and our purpose. And so we have to land at this question. This is the tough question. I know I've been dropping bombs on you guys. You guys have been great. But number six, I have to ask the question because we have to keep it real. Have we given up on trusting God? You seriously have to ask yourself that question. I have to ask myself that question. Have I given up on trusting God? Because trusting God means you agree to advancing something bigger than yourself. God is calling us to be responsible with the beyond that he's about to give us. He's calling us not to be reckless, not to mess it up, not to be afraid of it. He's calling us to do something with this beyond, and that could be intimidating. I have a story. Um, there was a couple years ago where I don't remember if I was fasting or not, but it was just a time where I was getting closer with God. And have you ever had those moments where God, you know, he pushes, he's like, hey, I want you to worship me. And you're like, okay, God, I'll worship you. And you're kind of like, mm -hmm. he's like, no, just, just sing and pray. And so I think it's, it's got to be like six in the morning and I'm outside and I'm just, I, I build up the courage to just worship God and just to sing. And once you, you cross over your comfort zone, you just feel like you're in heaven already, Right. Just, just nothing can go wrong, and I'm just praising God and loving him. I'm even trying to dance, I'm trying to be like David, but with clothes on, you know? And so I'm doing that, and then wouldn't you know, so as I'm, as I'm worshiping God, I take a step, and I hear a and I'm like, oh, God, what is that? And I see under my foot, I killed a snail. And, I mean, normally it's just a snail. Who cares? But when you're, when you're, clo when you're connected with God, you're like, oh, my God, I killed your creation. And I'm just, I'm just staring at this snail, like, looking around, like I'm about to get arrested. And it's just, what do I do? And I'm like, oh, this is a test. God wants to see my faith. And so I put my hand over the snail, and I say, in Jesus' name, I'm, I kid you not, I went, in Jesus' name, you're healed. And when I lifted up my hands, guess what happened? Nothing. That snail was dead. And I'm just like, oh, my, I didn't know what to do. I felt so bad. And it was in that moment, God told me, he said, you can love me, you can serve me, but you can still cause damage. And he told me, you need to be careful with what I'm about to entrust with you. And I was like, wow, that was rough. But that's true, right? God can trust us with things. God can trust us with our beyond, and we can screw it up. And that's why we have to take our beyond seriously and so the question have we given up on trusted God you know you have to go you have to look at the reality at the natural of this right because it's hard to trust God you can say it takes a lot of time um, it takes resources um, God I have to constantly cast vision with my family on why we're here at church you know at least twice a week Where's my worship team at? You know, we have to be here, what, have to wake up at 4 a.m. to get ready to be here at 5 a.m. And we have to stay all the way till the end. And we got to smile all the way through it, right? There's so many reasons why it would be easier not to trust God. This is just the natural. And you have to go there, right? But you don't stay there. Because if we were to really go there and stay there and pursue it, it's like I'm saying, it's like I'm okay with God saying to me, Hey, Frank, I appreciate the time, your time with me. And it seems like there's nothing else I can say to make this work out between us. I'll completely step out of your life so I won't interrupt your plans anymore. And that's like, dang. Like, but that's, you can't, you can't be, there's no gray area. It's black or it's white. Trust God or don't. And I'm not okay with that. If, if God were to tell me that, I'd be like, oh, Lord, no, come back. I wouldn't want to leave the house. I feel like I would die, like I would get cancer, like somebody would kill my kids. You know, I, there's just so many things that I, came to life. I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what God protects me from. 
And I, I need God's protection. I need his grace. I need his blessings. And so I need to stop playing around. I need to trust God. So number seven, the last and final key. In order to get our beyond, in order to get to our beyond, we have to believe that beyond the natural is possible for our lives. The impossible is for us because God doesn't work in the limitations of what we see in Noah's reality. God operates on a whole different level. And that's the level that God's elevating us to. And that's the beyond that we're going to get to. I believe that during this fast, you know, you can, you can pray and you can believe. What would be incredible is if you were to say, you know, during this fast, God, I want you to just direct me, guide me. I want to pray for people so that they'll get healed. You know, I want to pray so that um, one day I'll pray and someone who's dead will come back to life. God, I want to pray. I want to be in a new, uh, a whole new incredible ministry that's never been done before. I want to be completely sold out to you. Or you could even keep it simple. And I think this is the key where it rests in the simplicity is that during this fast, I believe that God wants to heal us. You know, and I'm no different on this stage. I have my issues that I need to work out. And I can ignore it and try and go for the big dogs when in reality I'm never going to get there unless I fix everything inside. I believe that during this fast, God wants to show us the impossible, incredible plans that he has for us. I believe during this fast, God wants to take the destruction in our lives, not get rid of it, but turn it around for our benefit. I believe during this fast, God wants to show you that he's a promise keeper and he's worthy of your trust. I believe during this fast, God wants to show you how to unlock his power in your life. And I believe in this fast, God wants to show us what it really looks like to be his son and daughter on earth. Something we've never seen before. Something that's not beyond the corner, but beyond the horizon. And we don't even know what that looks like. And so I have a proposition for all of us. This year, let's make see beyond not a cliche, not a hype tag, not something that we forget, just write on the wall and never look at it, but let's make see beyond something that changes our life forever. Because if not, what's the point? It's just another year wasted. Amen.